what is a weed. And some of them are really sneaky. They look just like a plant. Other than that, people in the community garden go and say, Sarah, come here, what's a weed? So that's my tip for you. Anyone, well, I'll even say uh, that's, you know, th things change what we consider weeds over time. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> as, as we find out, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I was at ShopRite, you, you know, uh, last year, and, you know, dandelions were being sold uh, left and right, dandelion greens, which, of course, for many years, everyone couldn't pull out fast enough and get rid of. And, and now milkweed, I see them selling that in the, you know, now that, now that we're trying to, now we're aware of the importance to butterflies. So, and right, as we say with foraging, many of these weeds have medicinal qualities uh, or more incredibly, you know, edible, very nutritious. So that, you know, that's a whole skill set onto itself, you know, especially local weeds and what, what you could utilize. I, I think most weeds, and they could also tell you a lot about the soil, you know, what, what, what's growing there. You know, the weed gives away a lot of information. Anyone else you see that, Michael, uh, raising uh, hand or anything? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's Bill here. Uh, if you planted it. You have to unmute. I, I did oh, it. Did? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, if you planted it, then it's not a weed. And I, when you plant seeds, you should definitely mark with little uh, sticks or markers where the rows are, so you know exactly where they're supposed to come up. And uh, many of the stuff you're gonna put out in the garden is gonna be a plant already. So you know, you'll, you'll buy stuff and you'll plant it out. In that case, there's no, no question. So uh, I like to keep my weeds out of the garden. So, I will say at the community garden on the topic of is it a weed or not it's a weed, what we do is purslane, for example, purslane, we have a few people who like that as a vegetable, so I'll let a controlled amount of it grow because it will take over and I'll sort of save that and when they come to the garden I'll say look, you know, here's your weed slash vegetable. So take what you want and then the rest of it's going to go. Cause it's, it's a balance between, do you let all the weed slash vegetables live or do you thin them out? Because if you have a fertile garden and you've amended your soil, your weeds will become quite large. And I've seen many people who cultivate beautiful weeds, but it's, it's, a, it's a lifelong learning event, learning what a weed is. Okay, next question. I guess I, if no one else is raising their hand, I think that was great. I, I, I would expect a lot more on weeds. I know that's a big topic, but all right, what's the best way to keep track of what I planted? Again, any takers on that one? So, so this question means like, you know, I mean, like I write something down on a piece of paper, I planted it where and when, and then what kind of seeds were they? And like every year I'm starting over again. And, and I, probably everyone knows this. Does, does someone have a really good way of keeping track of what they planted, where, and when? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, one of, uh, one of the things that, and I haven't been the best at this part of doing a lot more earnestly is you got to get yourself a, a gardening journal and keep it. And it's not necessarily necessarily where you have to write stuff down in it every day, but you use it to just keep track of certain observations. Um, when you plant certain vegetables, when they seem to come on a little bit better, because you may find, uh, for instance, one of the things that I always thought before was that planting peas in the very beginning of the season, as soon as it, you can work the ground, because that's what it says on all the seed packages, was the best time to do it. And one of the books that I've been reading, uh, Will Bonsell's Guide to um, Radical Self-Reliant Gardening, um, he basically has said that no, it's really kind of if you plant them in uh, or around the last half of April that you'll get the best yields out of them. So the gardening journal will allow you to keep track of where you plant certain things year to year. So you're rotating your crops effectively. And also when you plant certain things and when they do better and when maybe you're trying to get them in a little bit too early. It's Sarah here. 
if you really want a detailed history of your garden, first of all, I would always keep a journal. But if you want to really know everything about your garden, for the community garden's pretty good size and we rotate throughout the season. So I subscribe to a program called, it's through, um, of course I have a brain fade now. It's a gardening um, computer program. And what it does, you draw up a grid of your entire garden. It's it's a lot of work. I mean, you have to have a sizable garden and really want to keep records for this. But you plot out your garden, the raised beds, the fences, the irrigation, everything. You plot it all out. And then as we plant, you know, I don't put in every exact number of plants, but I put in the tomatoes and the variety of tomatoes, you know, Swiss chard, peppers, blah, blah, blah. I put everything in and you put in the time you put them in, the approximate time they stay in the ground. And you can also put in the varieties you planted. And this, you do this throughout the season, you can see it month by month or an annual um, plot. I mean, you can print this thing out. And then when the next year comes around, you can, it'll save that. You start to do with a blank page and it shows you where you had your crops planted the last year. So, it's really it's labor intensive, but for a large garden that I know my perennial bed, I put things in, I say I know where they are, and then I can't figure out where they were last year. So for this type of garden, it's it's a good tool. And you, you can't remember the uh, Mother Earth News or anything? No, Mother, Mother Earth, Earth, Earth News. Mother Earth News Garden. I had Twenty five dollars. Sorry, I have to step out. Twenty five dollars a year. <laughs> Check yeah, it out. You can um, you get like thirty days free or something. So it's seven days free. Oh, it's seven now. Yeah. Oh, I've been doing it for a long time. So when I started, it was thirty days free. You know, if you've got a a, a, a little raised bed, don't do it, obviously. But for a good sized garden, it's it's really worthwhile, and you can keep very detailed records. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else, Michael? Uh, I, I can talk about what I do. I do something, well, I've been gardening for a long time, so I don't keep as extensive records. I, I have a single sheet and I have the beds on the sheet and I allocate the amount of space that I want to spend for each vegetable. And I mark it with different colors so that it's, uh, you know, spring, summer, fall. So the, as you, as you succession plant, you have, different things. So that's all planned out in advance. And then of course, it doesn't really work out that way because sometimes things take longer than you expect and you have to start modifying everything. So I don't worry so much about getting the details right. I just modify as I need to. And, uh, and I keep those sheets each year. So at least I start off with knowing what vegetables were planted where. And so I don't plant, I, I do crop rotation. So I don't plant the same things in the same space every year, uh, particularly uh, brassicas, which I find get diseases quite a bit. Uh, so that's, that's what I do. It's pretty, but I've been gardening for 45 years. So a lot of it is in my head. So, but that sheet uh, is enough for me to be able to do it. <clears throat> Bill, sometime could you like take a couple pictures of your sheets and uh, share them with us? They're very sloppy. <laughs> I don't know if anybody could read them except me. But <laughs> I can't even read them. My <laughs> wife says she can't read them. <laughs> Still, it would be, I guess, maybe, I, you know, I was a Chinese major, so I'm sort of look, used to looking at pages full of uh, <laughs> strange characters. But, I, but, I know, but Michael, I know what you're saying, that, right? A lot of times you plant stuff and you, and you put a little popsicle stick in there and you find and then somehow the popsicle stick gets knocked over and then you and, and then you just have no idea what anything is and it or, or like Bill says you plant something that's a you know perfect for the fall or early spring and then it grows way later than it's supposed to and then you forgot you planted it so I think yeah I think it's very important to write out either, either by a computer program or some type of sheet of paper where you plant anything the date you plant it and you know, you know, do it in a grid that you could recognize because no matter what you put in the ground, it's definitely gonna get covered up or knocked over or the mark is gonna get wiped away. 
So yeah, I, that, that's happened to me many times. Right, <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'll remember, and then I have no idea what it is till it's growing. So. I, I would like to add to that just quickly. I agree with absolutely everything everybody said. I'm a big proponent on journaling and making sure that you have some sort of documentation. And um, two things. One is I order a bunch of paint stirs from Amazon. They're fairly cheap and they're a pretty good indicator markers in the garden. And the second thing is I use my phone and I take pictures of where things are. And I make sure I'm far enough back to be able to realize where I am in the garden. But even this year, I found that it helped me so much looking back at last year's photos to see where what was and just the evolution of what grew over the course of the season. So photos and videos on my phone were a great way to help put that into an archive. Yes, I could attest that she's frighteningly organized and you'll see it during the presentation. <laughs> All right, uh, I see here. Well, do you want, I want to read this next one. I started watermelon seedlings. Wait, let me get that. Sorry, I lost the question. Well, oh, oh, Carly, do you want to just ask it and pop up? Sure. Um, I don't want to interrupt because, well, I mean, I was just putting it in there in case. No, no, no. But we, I think we were done with it. It's your turn. Um, so go. I started watermelons seedlings a few weeks ago and I was like following instructions on the packet and everything and now I'm wondering if um, based on Chris's spreadsheet if I started them way too early and whether there's any issues and whether anybody's had success growing watermelons. So did you start them inside and how or, or did you plant yeah, them out? Yeah. Inside, they're oh, inside, okay. happy inside. Yeah, right now. So uh, I'll okay. So anything that I know that's really big and viney and likes to take off, if you are going to start them indoors, you should start them like no more than two weeks before your expected time to put them out. What's going to happen is, is they're going to take off and grow really quick. Are you finding that like you're growing out of the pot way too fast right now? No, they're. They're moving pretty slow, <laughs> slow and steady. Oh, do they have a, enough light where they are? Maybe not. They're in the window. But. Okay. So, I mean, that might be a thing. So, I, I mean, that's just what I found. So, anything that's going to give you, like, like great big vines that are just going to go on and on with big leaves, either do a direct sow of that out because the grow rate for it, like the season, the time that it's going to take you actually to start to harvest isn't necessarily very long. And I always think of starting indoors to be able to gain that jump on mother nature and like help extend our season um, or do it like two weeks before, because the problem that I've heard mostly is that they just start to take off. And once they start to take off, it's like, oh no. And then they don't like to be jostled so much and rerooted and up and transplanted. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any experience with that. Uh, I, I grow watermelons fairly successfully. Um, I use sugar babies, the small ones. And I plant maybe three or four vines. And so you get half a dozen watermelons or sometimes a few more. Uh, it's okay to start them now, but I wouldn't put them out for a while. Um, you really have to look at the weather really carefully. Uh, it would be at least the middle of May, I think, and maybe even later than that, before I would put watermelons out without protection. Now, if you protect them with some garden fabric or something like that, you can put them out a little earlier, uh, but you also have to then be prepared to intervene if it gets cold. So, you know, we could have a really cold spell, in which case you might, th uh, I intervene a lot because the weather is so erratic. So I would throw some plastic <laughs> over it or something. Uh, other than that, if the plants aren't getting too big, uh, it's, it's okay to just keep, it, keep them, I would give them more sunlight though. Thank you. Anyone else with watermelon or? Uh... 
Okay, Michael, you have, do you have another it's, question? It's, you don't think I'm completely asleep over here. This is Frank. I just want to echo the comments on the sugar baby watermelons. In this area, if there's anything that's going to grow, most likely, uh, most likely the sugar babies. So good luck with them. Good luck with the seeds. But either way, uh, when they start coming up, you should enjoy them. What kind did you plant, by the way? I don't. I don't know. They're just called watermelons. I'll type. I'll find. I'll go find oh. out. Put it in. All right. Awesome. It'll be fun. I'm sure. Just go. Okay. Has anyone established a seed exchange? Hmm. I know Nicole will want to chime in on this one. No, um, I haven't established one. I had met with Chad a couple of months ago to talk about it because I got really excited after I participated in my first ever super duper seed swap. Just it. <laughs> <laughs> so basically you put together 20 seed packets of, of your collection, of your arsenal of seeds. It could be 20 different varieties, 20 of the same varieties, whatever you like. And you put them in an envelope and you send them off to, um, I sent mine to Connecticut to the woman that organizes it. She collects all of them and then picks 20 random packets from everybody else who's participated and sends them back. So you have no idea what you're going to get, which was a lot of fun. Um, and I, done, I did a couple of them more after that. When I talk in the presentation about seeds tonight, I definitely wanted to hear back from the community to see if anybody would be interested in doing a, sweet, a seed swap or exchange. Quite frankly, right now, where we are in the season right now, I'm way too busy with what's happening for the garden and trying to prep to try to start to organize that because I'd like to be able to give something my full attention to be able to make sure or try my very best for it to succeed. But maybe once everything's been transplanted, we can kind of revisit that while waiting for everything to grow. Um, but yeah, I'd love to know if people are into doing either a seed swap or an exchange, um, having some sort of seed bank and hearing back what everybody thinks. If, if some people are interested in, in trying to work out a seed swap, like for this spring, um, if you could email Chad and I, or email Chad especially, I, sh I shouldn't just follow along with your Chad, but you know, we've discussed this. If, if people want to try to do that, you know, we'd have to plan it the right way so it's done safely and whatnot. Uh, email Chad and we'll, we'll work on that offline. Go ahead, Gary. I, ju I just know for myself that I'm not going to have, uh, I, I have more seed than I'm going to grow this year for certain things. And that I'd rather see them g get used while they're fresh and, and for people who didn't get a chance to pick up varietals of certain things. Um, now, you know, I'm buying my, my stuff from Wadesons and Werners and stuff. It's not, and some catalog stuff. So there's a bunch of different kinds of seed, but I'd, I'd be interested in, in not having to go to the store every time I need three or four seeds um, to start off or six seeds to start off a couple things like for the sugar babies, for example, or something like that. Also, I will trade bamboo for seeds. So, you know, uh, just another plug on getting rid of the bamboo. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. I'm totally, I'll, uh, I'll let you know about the bamboo for seeds. And I'll say this real quick. I don't know how many of you have the um, next door app. Has anybody gotten anything in the mail about it? It's, it's a community member thing. So I'm in a next door, it's a Warwick Neighbors app. And I started a Warwick Gardeners and Homesteading page. I'm thinking now after um, what Garrett just said, what if we put together or maybe I'll try or if anybody else is really good at this, I'm not offended if you wanna take the lead um, to put maybe just like a document together, like a page of a listing of varieties and maybe wants and has you know, for or wants and needs or requests from people around. And like right now I've been doing a lot of Facebook pickups and stuff. Like people are doing porch pickups or, you know, things left in your mailbox. We can totally trade throughout the community right now because I agree. I, I order a lot of stuff from catalogs and I was pumped for this season. And like, that's something I do during the winter, you know, to help those winter days go by. You're looking at see catalogs, figuring out what your garden is going to be. Um, but now I know like Baker Creek, Hudson Valley Seed Co. So many of these places are shut down now because people have just flooded them. 
So I'm sure there's a bunch of people around who don't have seeds, especially the newbies that want to grow certain things. So um, what do you guys think about that? Is anybody interested or, you know, things? Okay, well, we'll, 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 we'll get, you know, we'll get back to that, especially, you know, maybe, especially after you give your presentation, it feeds right into that. So we'll get back to the seed conversation. Also, maybe we'll start a separate committee on the, on seeds, which is a huge issue, as you're saying. But unless anyone has anything to say, is there any other questions, Michael, uh, on the chat or uh, email? No, let me see. Anyone just want to ask? Uh, um, actually, there's one, I just want to make one point of order. Chris agreed to do his presentation tonight, but he also said he had certain family obligations. Uh, and so he needed to go after about half an hour. Chris, do you want to do your, your current week presentation right now or wait a little bit? Perfect. So I, can, I can go over quickly right now because uh, over this weekend, there wasn't a tremendous amount. Most of my stuff is still going on in, in the greenhouse. But the main things that I did is I got my early potatoes in uh, this, this weekend and also transplanted a lot of my brassicas. Um, basically, I always set those up now where they're in between two rows of, um, of onions, the, of onion sets that I plant. So the onion sets are already coming up. I transplanted the brassicas in there. And uh, one of the things that I found with that is I tried doing a lot of brassicas earlier on, a lot of broccoli inside of my polytunnel. And the ones that I kept in the greenhouse um, are actually have much more of a head start on the ones that are in the polytunnel because they were all started at the same time. Um, let me think what else is uh, what else is going on out there. Those are the main things that I planted. Right now, it's just really kind of waiting for a lot of the greens and early season crops to come along. I tried getting a head start on some of my tomatoes with the frost that came in, but that was pretty iffy in the polytunnel. Um, only about half of them ended up surviving, but you know I've got a lot in reserve, so it, it wasn't really that big of a risk to take. Wait, uh, so before one second before we leave uh, before you leave us, Chris, I think someone yeah. said they had a question about chickens. So I'd rather I want I'd rather you get it while you're still here. <laughs> who, who had a question on chickens? This is Carly. I had submitted a question by email about chickens in the village. I know that in the village of Warwick, I know there's like a you're not supposed to have chickens in the village, but I was wondering whether there had been any conversations with the village about waiving that requirement specifically during this time and what the chances might be from you guys perspective um, i'm going to defer on that with the legal matter for the village to somebody who lives in the village because i honestly don't know okay i'm not i'm not aware myself uh anyone have any knowledge about chickens in the village i live in the village and you're not going to want to hear this but i am strongly opposed to chickens in the village so you would have to ask Michael knew hard about that. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions that we have? Uh, yeah, Chad, I, I just wanted to answer that one too. Um, okay. There was, somebody did try to get that approved. Uh, and of course, this was before the virus, but I mean, this was a few years ago, someone tried to get um, chickens approved in the, in the village and it was, it was uh, knocked down, so. Yeah, I know in Greenwood Lake we're not we're not supposed to have chickens, but you know I know some people do have chickens, but you know I think as long as they could do it quietly, people seem to be okay with it. But I think it seems to be a contentious issue. Car Carly, do, do, how do your neighbors feel about it? To me, that would be the big question. If somebody living next to you was going to complain, they want chickens too. <laughs> they want chickens too. <laughs> Um, I, I'll say this, the, the New York State actually requires seven acres for farm assessment. Um, if you have seven acres of land in, in the state of New York and can prove that you've made $10,000 uh, worth of profit off of your land for two years, you can get farm assessment. Now, five acres allows you the opportunity to keep a horse or two. I'm not exactly sure. Seven acres allows you to have other livestock. Um, not including chickens. Chickens you can have on a smaller parcel, but I believe the town says you're allowed to have up to 10, um, but I'm not exactly sure on that. Is that correct, Chris? Thank you. Um, 10 chickens per, per two acres or something like that until you get to that five or seven mark. Um, with the farm assessment, uh, with seven acres, you can actually get uh, trucks and put farm plates on them and stuff like that. Just little information. 
Yeah, I think, I think this is going to become more of an issue as, you know, we're going through these difficult times as things become an issue. We'll see how it plays out. Okay, last year I planted a few gooseberries, a couple thrived and a couple survived. Uh, I guess some did good, some didn't. When's the best time to transplant the survivors of gooseberries? Any gooseberry takers? I have no answer to that question except this. We've had the same bush for the last 20 years. It produces and uh, makes the best jam. All right. Well, it seems like, I guess, the. Uh, Are there any transplanting rules of thumb in general? Uh, I would say that uh, the spring is a good time to transplant before it gets too hot. And so um, if you transplant, you should do it on a cloudy day. You should water the plants at that time and keep them watered and uh, mulch them after that so they don't dry out and cross your fingers and uh, you see what happens. Okay. Anyone else on gooseberries now? Yeah, it seems like for spring or I guess even maybe fall, uh, uh, you know, we're probably early soon will be best, but I guess maybe, you know, mid late fall also to transplant. Yeah, if fall is a good time to do it. Uh, summertime is not the time to do it. Right, right. <clears throat> so, and, uh, you know, I guess check uh, while, while some of them made it, some of them didn't. I don't know, check out, you know, do you have a lot of sun? I get bed berries probably need a lot of sun, I expect, and, you know, the drainage. All right, any other questions coming up or answers on gooseberry or any other questions? And we could, uh, Anyone else? Any hands? I can't quite see the participants. I don't know. Uh, maybe Michael, if you could tell me anyone else. Any questions or in the chat? I have a question. Yes. Um, I, I have great luck with gooseberries and terrible luck with black currants. They're next to each other. But that's not my question. My question is I've not had any luck with asparagus, even when I've left them, I mean, long enough. Um, I did have them planted near rhubarb and I moved the rhubarb, but now where my asparagus are just covered in weeds. So I guess I have to weed, but I just, they're just not propagating. They're not multiplying. I can't get anything going really. Any advice for asparagus? I, 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 I'm not a biggest expert here, but I can say one thing. Um, I heard somebody last week talking about how they saw their asparagus and, and I know in previous years, I'd already seen asparagus by this time. I finally saw some popping up and I suspect what happened was some came up earlier and then froze because it was so warm early. I could be wrong about that, but I finally saw some popping up. So maybe look through your weeds and, and maybe you still have something coming up from last year. So it could be that you know, the cold sort of slowed down what really was an early start and then so you maybe still have something. Okay. Mary was gonna say something, go ahead. Uh, Gail, how how long have you had the asparagus in there? Oh, um, five, six years. And did you get asparagus before? I've never had much luck with asparagus. I mean, I get one a week, maybe. Oh. Um, okay. <laughs> it doesn't make um, a meal. No. Okay, well, you did you, and you planted them yourself, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, it does take a few years for them to produce, mm -hmm. and they, they are, I think they're pretty heavy feeders. I don't know if you fertilize them. And then um, they don't like weeds. So um, if, if it gets weedy in there a lot, they, they won't do well. And they, they do need sun. Right, so they get sun. What, what, sun. What, do you, what do you feed them? Well, there's a lot of things. You could give them um, well-rotted manure. You could give them um, blood meal and bone meal. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what we usually use, those, those three things. Um, yeah, the other thing they like is really deep bed. When you start them off, you really want to have a very enriched deep bed when you plant them. And then you mulch them so they don't have any weeds. Uh -huh. And uh, so if you do that, they, they would probably, I mean, our bed is about 25 years old now, mm -hmm. um, 20, 22 years old. 
but uh, it's um, it produces quite a bit up to now, and uh, you know we get quite a few. How many plants and, did you and not put, put anything in with them? Is that correct? Yeah, I don't think they like, and the roots also go pretty far. So you don't want to plant anything too close to them either, because that would interfere with the roots that are spreading. I have one more question. Um, I have masses of wood ash. Does anybody use that in their garden for anything? What do you use it for? Well, you can you can use it first of all. Uh, it, it also repels insects. So when I plant out some plants that I, and I want to keep insects away, I'll spread a light layer of wood ashes around the plant. And the insects don't like to crawl through it. And of course, after it rains and stuff, then it has to be reapplied. But it, it's good for certain types of, of insects to keep them away. Uh, you can also mix it in because it's also a nutrient, but you have to be careful. Uh, it's very alkaline. So you don't want to mix too much into your soil, and you probably want to do a pH test uh, to see where your soil is at before you add much, much wood ashes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's terrific, actually, if you grow parsley. And sometimes you'll see that there are these worms that get in the roots, or some kind of insects that get in the roots, and the parsley plant just completely collapses. Well, if you put wood ashes around them, that takes care of those. Mm. So it can save the parsley plants. Gail, how many asparagus plants did you put in? I think I started with about six. I got them from Midsummer Farm, and then I probably put in maybe another six. OK. No, I, growing up, I grew up in uh, the Midwest, and we had a large asparagus bed and a large rhubarb bed. Actually, they were next to each other. And I don't know how many plants they originally put in, but you do need a fair number of plants. It takes a while for them to like spread out and you, you know, to get a number of shoots. So at five years, I would not expect a big harvest yet. Okay, thank you. Weed them, fertilize, they'll come. <laughs> if you plant them, they will come? <laughs> yeah, Usually. patience, patience. <laughs> Okay, uh, this maybe the last question or any, uh, any other questions? I want to ask one other thing. Um, would, uh, would you plant more asparagus? If you would, would, you, would anyone advise Gail to, to put more asparagus plants near one, the ones you already have just to make the better stronger or is it too late for that? Why not add some more? Well, this time of year? This is, right, yeah. Yeah, we put them in now. Okay. If you really want a big asparagus bed, go for it. Do you have the room? Yeah, I do. Well, you, can also, you can also get them at different ages. You know, They're, you can get two year or three year or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you get the three year ones, they're going to obviously produce quicker. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, Michael? Otherwise, we can. Head right into uh, Bill, given his brief rundown of his his gardening week. Um, let's see. The, early on, somebody asked, "How do I go about getting bamboo?" And the answer is, "Contact Garrett." Was there anybody who wasn't online when that answer was given out? Does anyone need that contact information? Speak up now, or forever hold your peace. Okay, so. Um, I want to make, so let's, yes, we could have Bill do next, but I want to say one thing. We've all been sitting down for 45 minutes. We're about halfway through. I suggest we stand up and shimmy in place. As much as required of sheltering in place, just stand up, move a little bit, then we'll sit down and get to Bill's presentation. So it's stand up uh, and shimmy in place. Got it? You can do it off camera if you want. Yeah, you could do that. I guess we could do that. <laughs> All right, we're all shimmied out. I think 
think actually we should do that and make with the idea that maybe some people are actually going to turn it into a bathroom break, right? So some people were going to shimmy longer than others. <laughs> Put yeah. Okay. Okay. I I actually put together some pictures of a PowerPoint, and I don't know if it's going to work because I've never done this before. Uh, but if I hit share screen, I I think my PowerPoint is right behind the Zoom, you, and I'm told Bill, that it yeah. won't work. Hit hit share screen, and then a little screen will come up, and you have to pick. The PowerPoint from the different options and then hit the share button. Okay. I hit the button. Did you hit it twice though? Uh, let me try it again then. Yeah, okay, it's... and then I want you so you click on the, the program that you oh, want to yeah, share. Okay. There we go. And then the share button in the and lower right hand share. corner. Okay. Oh, there we go. Woohoo! Okay, so I'm gonna maybe make it bigger, or I don't have to if people can see it. Can people see it? Yes. Okay. If you want to do um, on the upper left hand corner, it says from beginning. Click that. Yeah, I did that. No, click it. Double click it. Oh well, there we go. Yeah. Better get rid of the pictures on the right side. Ah. Uh, you take that down. I don't so know. Now we're seeing your presentation. Can you go to the beginning? No, but the, how do we get rid of the picture? We have the we, we have we the, have the pictures. We want right to put side. them on the top. Oh, okay, them. just ignore those. We don't see them. Yeah, but but, but yeah, I'm blocking some of the writing. <laughs> you oh. don't see. The, can you see all the writing? Yeah. You can. Okay. Well, you can't. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. So that's fine then. So what I'm doing this week, I have uh, some pictures. I'm I'm mulching. So I'm. I'm getting chips from the town park, uh, wood chips, and uh, I'm putting like four layers of newspaper down, uh, getting rid of the weeds first, putting the, the paper down, and then putting the chips on. And then I also had some mulch delivered, uh, the brown mulch here, and I'm doing the same thing. I'm weeding, uh, putting the paper down, and then covering the paper with, you know, two or three inches of mulch. So uh, I like to do this before it gets too hot. So it's a lot of work. So that's one. Uh, I'm getting the beds ready to, for the warm weather crops. So I have pre-done beds because I use the same beds every year and I have walkways that are chipped but not fully yet. So what I do is I take a spade or a pitchfork and I loosen the soil. I don't turn it. You're supposed to just loosen the soil. And then I take the uh, deep fork and I go through the bed and I loosen it down to maybe 16, 18 inches. And then I rake it even uh, so that you don't get, uh, so when it rains hard that it, the soil doesn't erode into the, into the walkways. So if it's even, there's less chance of that happening. And one other thing that you can do is, is cover, the plast, uh, cover the bed with plastic to raise the soil temperature. That's optional. But if it stays cold like this, it's maybe not a bad idea. So when it's sunny, you know, you'll get that soil warm so that the plants, the warm weather crops, when you put them in there, they'll be, they'll be ready to go. Uh, I'm also hardening plants, so I have a number of brassicas and some spinach and some other plants. And uh, hardening, if you don't know that, uh, you don't take plants from a greenhouse and put them directly out. They need to be put out gradually over the course of perhaps a week. So what I do is I put them out in, in a protected location. This is outside of my attached greenhouse against the house and it's protected from wind. And you start with a short time, you know, maybe in the morning for a half hour, an hour the first day, and increase it by an hour each day, repeat it for six or seven days, and, and they're ready to go. You can actually plant them right out into the garden. They won't be set back because they, they're now used to the weather. 
when you do this, though, you have to be aware of the weather itself, high winds, uh, heavy rains, uh, potential other problems that you could have. So uh, just keep aware. Don't put them out on a really windy day, for example. They might get damaged. Uh, I started my peas actually March 8th because it was so warm in March. So my peas are actually up and I cover them with either garden fabric or slitted plastic for protection. And I've just recently mulched them. I put leaf mulch around them. And my next step is to actually put up a trellis. And uh, it, depending on how big the peas get, there's different kind of trellises you can use. Uh, if they're really tall, like sugar snaps or some types of snow peas, they might get six feet or more. So uh, what I do is I use a, a metal pole and I have a, a pipe, a 10 foot pipe, an EMT, EMT pipe from, from like uh, Home Depot. Uh, they're, they're fairly cheap. And, and then I put that onto, the, onto the, <clears throat> the, the pole that I, the fence, and I tighten it on there. And then I just take uh, netting and I just flip it right over the pole in the middle. And then I tighten the, uh, the edges with uh, the little garden staples. So that's one way that I trellis large peas. And then for short peas, you can do almost anything. Some small stakes with some cord uh, or sticks, if you can find you know, cuttings that you can just stick in there, something that gives them support. Uh, small peas might only get to be 14 or 16 inches. So you don't really need that much. Um, I have a, a little lettuce bed planted. I plant every two weeks, I plant about 20, 25 uh, seeds and I move the plants out to the garden. And I always have one of these maturing and one of them planted because it takes two or three weeks for them to mature. So my, my plan is to have uh, lettuce for salads for the entire summer. So um, I find for, for what we use, we need about 20 or 25 plants every two, two weeks. Uh, if it's really warm, I protect them from frost. So you see the little wire things and the fabric the, from the cold and, and frost. We've had some early frost. And uh, then I use garden fabric over them. And I just opened that up so you can see the, the plants. And, you know, they're, they're pretty far along. <clears throat> One of the things you have a problem with with any plants in the spring is the slugs. They somehow overwinter. And since the stuff is growing early, they love it. So uh, you have to be aware, of, you know, watch out for those. Um, I am taking down my, I have cold frames over the winter. So uh, this is spinach that has been overwintered. I've been harvesting it for about a month now. And it's just about done. There's still some more there. And so at this point, without a frost coming, I will just take the, the whole cold frame off of that and just use the spinach uh, until it's down to almost nothing, and then I'll uh, take it out completely and replant with something else. <clears throat> Again, slugs find any enclosure in the winter and find their way to eat the, the plants that are growing. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I put out brassicas several weeks ago, and again, I put stuff out really early because I protect it. And what I do really early is that, that's uh, uh, Chinese cabbage and uh, uh, different, different brassicas, broccoli, uh, cauliflower, and so forth. And I cover it with uh, the garden uh, fabric. And I also put jugs of water in there. And uh, the water keeps it from getting too warm if it's really sunny, but it also releases the heat uh, if it gets cold. And so it moderates the temperature underneath the fabric. And so um, I find that that works pretty well for me to keep things going in cold weather. Again, slugs are a problem this time of the year. OK, this one is hard to see, but it's a, a small four by four foot bed. And I planted seeds, beech, rad, beech radishes, and carrots in there. And I've marked it, and it's hard to see, but they're actually all up. They're all growing. They're about maybe a half inch tall. Some of them are 
more visible than others. And uh, what I do is I scatter the seeds in an area. I cover it with garden fabric, just put it right down over them to, to warm it up a little bit more, keep it from getting, uh, keep it moist. And uh, then I check regularly and once they start germinating, I just remove the fabric and then I thin them to the proper distance. And uh, for root crops, they usually don't transplant that well. So the idea is to, I, I plant a lot, of the, a lot of them and I just thin them. That's the end. Um, now I have to get out of this. Uh, Thank you. you. Stop sharing. Stop. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. Yeah, put it down. Reduce it. Uh, no, 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 no. It's not okay. reduced. Um, oh, where did the chair? Where'd it go? Right here. And that's not it. That's the PowerPoint. Oh, there we are. Okay, we're back. Okay. Uh, actually, I stopped your sharing. Uh, next time, next time I'll show you how to stop your own sharing. Yeah. Folks, I have the option to do that for you. So, uh, okay. okay. I, I, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to reshare with uh, Nicole Hickson is going to give us a little presentation on seed starting. All right. Let me unmute. There we go. Share screen. Okay, some she seed sharing love. Here we go. I figured I'd give everybody just a little background. I'm born and raised in Queens originally, so like the dream of Warwick came much later in life and planting. None of that was an option <laughs> when I was a kid growing up. I did my undergraduate studies for five years in Southern California. I have a master's in fine art. Uh, moved back to Long Island where my family had relocated to, hated it, and took a trip up to Warwick and fell in love with it. Um, that was while I was getting ready to start my master's degree in fine art. Got married during that time, had my son during that time in the wheelbarrow, and that finds us here. I'm gonna move forward now. So seed starting basics, right? Want, excuse me, I just wanna clarify. You had your son in a wheelbarrow? Yeah, I did. No. <laughs> okay. He loves clarifying. to sit in the wheelbarrow. He does. He loves being pushed around the yard. The kid just gets the biggest kick out of it. He gets mad when I have to haul stuff and then I got to take him out. Um, okay. Seed starting basics, right? I know this is, this is going to be, uh, so many of you know so much more than me, for, but for people that are just starting out and maybe if you can get like one thing from it, I'd be happy. So I'm gonna share what I know, all right? Why we start early, what is the seed, common issues with starting and hardening off, which Bill just covered a little bit about hardening off. So I'll just go through that one quickly. So why do we start indoors? Um, the basic reason is just to increase the days in our growing season, right? Up here in Warwick, we're about 6A is our zone, and we have about 150 days to get everything that we want grown in that period. So in order to increase that 150-day period, we're going to start indoors. Um, I just have listed here our estimated frost date and first and last. Next, what is a seed? Um, I tell my friends all the time, especially my Queens friends that look at me now, like how the heck are you doing all of this? Like, where did you learn this from? That a seed is basically just two leaves with some hope inside. You know, you gotta give it some love and show it some affection and some tenderness and it, it can work. Um, but the basics for starting indoors are everybody, you know, is, is the seed, the potting soil, a container, some water and some light. We're going to talk about common problems throughout this, okay? So it's going to be issues with germination, leggy plants, moisture levels, damping off, leaf discoloration, and mold on your soil. So germination issues, right? The seed is too old or it's not stored properly, um, which is pretty funny because I've seen different people and different stories about finding seeds from their great-grandmother right, from like the 1930s and, and seeds that have been passed down and that they can actually get them to germinate a little bit. But as most of you know, as every year progresses, the seed becomes less and less viable. So you wanna make sure that when you're starting, your seeds are fresh, which is another reason that we all right now should be sharing our seeds and what we have in order to have the best crop and the best success rate. Um, seeds are planted too deep. Part of this issue could be that you're not compacting your soil well enough. Not that it has to be super tight and down when you're first filling up those cups, but you want to make sure that it's pushed down enough that when you go to push a seed in, when you first go to water it, the water is not going to push it down or dislodge it. Which also brings me to the fact that you should moisten your potting soil before you go to put it in a cup. 
very, very important. Um, another thing is people say that there, there, there's not enough time for germination. And my husband and I are definitely culprits of this one where we, let's say we plant eight different, eight of the same seed in a row in one of our trays. And seven of them came up and each one had a marker or whatever the case was. And he goes, oh, look, we got a dud. And he just takes that cup and puts it aside. And then two weeks later, we have mystery seeds. Mystery seeds. <laughs> where nobody has any idea what this seed listing is anymore. So if you have, like, right now, we're getting ready to sell some plants and share some plants. So every once in a while, I give a friend, I'm like, here's a mystery seed. <laughs> a mystery plant. You're not going to know what it is until it comes up. I consider those to be special now, but if you have the room in your trays and if you can show a little patience, which I think that we can all practice a little bit more of, let it sit and see if it actually germinates because it just goes to show that even though if you are planting eight of the same kind of seed, one might take longer than the rest. Um, and another germinating issue is not using potting soil. Um, I've talked to some people who will just go outside and scoop soil up and put it into a cup and you could be bringing in fungus and bacteria and if you don't know if your beds have been amended or if you've done any testing that could be a problem. Potting soil is definitely, um, it helps to anchor your roots, it helps the water supply with oxygen and nutrients, it's, it's definitely the way to go. And lastly, with germinating, a thing that I find when I ask people, they're like, well, why didn't my seeds sprout? Like, what happened? What didn't I do? Depending on what you planted, a lot of seeds need heat to germinate. That soil has to be at a certain temperature. So tomatoes are going to love anything above 75 degrees. And if the ambient temperature in your house is set to about 68, 70, it's going to take a longer amount of time for that seed to be able to come up. So um, if... Like last year when I first started doing my own seeds, I used my regular heating pad, right? My good old sunbeam. Put that just on warm and left it on. This year, we upgraded to the heat mat. Now, very important, if you do do an upgrade to a heat mat, you're definitely gonna wanna get the thing that's on the left, and that's a temperature probe. Because if you just plug that heat mat in, that heat mat's just gonna jump to like 110 degrees and stay there and bake your soil and bake your seeds. It's not gonna be good. So you're gonna need a probe in order to tell you. So you put the probe in the potting soil and I've been woken up twice <laughs> this spring in the middle of the night to the probe going off like, what is that alarm? What is happening? But either I watered it or something happened, it dislodged and it was just letting me know that the soil was not the temperature that I was going for. And again, I mentioned tomatoes being above 75, but I hear a lot of people have problems with peppers. Peppers like warmth. Peppers need heat to germinate. So um, if you're looking to grow peppers, especially hot, like hot peppers, they definitely need it. You're going to need that heat mat. But you can definitely just use your regular heating pad on warm. Um, here's another issue that I hear a lot of people having are leggy plants, right? So if, if you don't know what a leggy plant is, there's a picture of one. They just become these long spindly things. Basically, what it's telling you is, I need more light. Give me more light. I do not have enough. That seed that has the hope and the two seed leaves in there has broken out its energy, cracked through the surface, and come on up. Now that it came up, it is so thirsty for light. It wants it and it can't find it. New seedlings should have 12 to 16 hours of light on them daily. Okay, that's like at a minimum. And that light should be, if like if you're using grow lights, should be no more than three inches above it. So to produce really strong plants. So you can go out and get grow racks that have lights on them. I've been very fortunate. I, um, I actually got all of mine from Facebook Marketplace and I've created some great relationships and met some awesome people. But I wanted to also show you if you're not going to buy used or buy new, these are ones that people put together themselves just to help um, their germination process and their, and their growing go better for them. So moisture. So we discussed this a little bit before about starting with the potting soil that has been moistened. Now, the best way that I think to describe how moist your plants should be while your seed's starting is you want it to be like a damp sponge. 
it, you don't want it like ringing, sawed out, super wet, and you don't want it dry. You want it to be like a damp sponge. Like you put it under the water and then you rinse it out so that it's gonna kind of contain that. Um, and then moisture also when we're first starting, you're gonna want a lid. So uh, if you go out and you get like a burpee tray or we have like the bootstrap farmer trays, which are we're hard and sturdy, easier for carrying around. They come with the toppers on them. But if you're starting yourself and you're just looking around the house, definitely go into your recycling bin, check out the strawberry container, get the rotisserie chicken thing out. Um, just make sure everything is cleaned super duper well before you attempt to start um, potting in here. With like the strawberry container or something else, if it has the holes on it, holes are good to help to be able to control some of that moisture that's in the top. But you could also put some tape over that, some masking tape. And then as you see, if it needs more or less moisture, remove that. And another great solution is just these storage containers that a lot of people have. And then once you start seeing them produce, once they've broken through, take the lids off. They're done but they've done their purpose. You're creating a greenhouse, you're trying to give them the best environment possible, the best start in life possible. So another issue that I've heard of um, is damping off, which is like, oh, so my seeds looked great, they were coming up and then like they committed suicide, something happened, they just fell over, I'm not really sure. So most of the time the issue with this is circulation and too much water, right? You're just, you're killing them that way. We have in our grow room slash my office is a fan. Most people have a stand-up fan that oscillates. From the minute we plant, we leave that fan in that office 24 hours a day on just oscillating on like a super low setting. This is gonna do a couple of things. It's gonna get the air flowing in the room. It's going to help your seedlings grow strong so that when they are brought out and starting to be hardened off, they're used to having a bit of a breeze. Um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, damping off. They, you need, your containers again need to be washed well and starting in fresh potting soil. Because if you start in potting soil that's already been used before, the nutrients in there are probably depleted and things are no good. Leaf discoloration. Leaf discoloration is a pretty good indicator that something is wrong. Okay, um, and you can go online and look and see what your discoloration is versus what you're missing. It's usually a nutrition thing, and most of the time it can be rectified, at least I have found so far, if you catch it early enough. With everything, I truly feel that you have to tune into your plants, right? You have to tune into what you're growing. And just, it's, I mean, it's just like walking into nature and figuring out what's happening, right? What do you need? Are you too wet? Are you too dry? Are, you know, do you need more sun? Do you need some vitamins? What can I do for you? So if you have that ability, you can really kind of figure out what's going on. And if not, the Google always helps. Um, one thing that we do is we, um, feed our plants. We either use Neptune's Harvest, which is a fish and seaweed fertilizer, but dare I say, using this indoors is tricky business. Okay, I see some of you nodding your heads. This stuff stinks. It's like fish guts. It is tough, especially with that fan on. And um, my office where we're growing is like a cr pretty much across the hall from my bedroom, which is a pretty interesting situation. Um, the other one we also use is chicken soup for the soil. But once the plants have really started, after they've gained their second set of first true leaves, you should be starting to put in nutrients back into the soil because they've been depleted now at this point. When you first start, start at like a half amount that you would do of um, the soluble moisture mixture container things. Sorry, I know it's late, I'm trying to blow through so it's not taking so long, so I apologize if I'm flying. Okay, mold on soil. White or green mold is a good indicator that soil is too wet, right? Makes perfect sense. Again, a way to rectify this is definitely for a fan and to make sure that you are watering properly. We like to water from the bottom. We do a lot of bottom, bottom watering in this house. Um, again, we use the, the trays from the bootstrap farmer. I've used like the, the burpee trays before and even like holding it with two hands, those trays will try to flip over. The bootstrap farmer tray is super, super sturdy and it, I can even carry it with water in it, which a lot of people know you can't do with most trays. So the nice thing about bottom watering is I find if I, I, I have an idea now 
because you gain experience with it, how much water to put in. I always call my plants the girls. The girls will drink up just what they need. When they are done drinking, they will stop and you will see that water on the bottom. I would say after like an hour, two hours, if there's still water there after two hours, do yourself a favor and empty out the bottom of that tray. Okay. You don't want your plants sitting in too much water. And after like two waterings from the bottom, you're going to want to go through and water them from the top to help dissipate a bunch of that sodium. Cause that's not going to dissipate in the potting mix. Okay. That's kind of, it kind of rises to the top. So when you water through the top again, it helps move all of that down. Um, yeah. So with mold, I've had it before. I've had it a couple of times this season. If you just kind of scratch it away it and, and you rectify these things, it'll go away and it won't harm your plants. So hardening off. Bill talked a little bit about hardening off before. I'm just going to reiterate slightly. When you know you're going to plant or you have that date on your calendar, circled, starred, so excited, planting day, right? Count back 10 days from that point and do it gradually. I am so much at fault of this. I will forget plants outside, right? I mean, like a couple of days in, you're like, oh, did I bring the plants in? And you got to run out and get them. Set yourself a timer on the phone. If you've gotten to this point and you're hardening off, the last thing you want to do is kill a plant because you've left it outside, all right? Um, and you got to remember, too, they led such a sheltered life that going outside, like imagine being in a cave, you know, your whole life, and then you come outside to see the sun. You are going to need some sunglasses and some shade. So just think about it that way. Put them in a shady spot. Don't put them somewhere where they can get a lot of wind exposure and start very, very slow. Imagine emerging from the cave the first time for hardening off. Bill also mentioned this, succession planting. I'm a big fan of this, to making sure, or trying to, trying to make sure that you have what you want throughout the season, if you can get it. So you could do this in like two to three week intervals, or it depends on what you're growing for succession planting. And I wanted to talk about seed swapping. I figured we could, uh, together we can grow, and we could do that, but we touched on that briefly before. Here is a list of my favorite spots for seeds and gear. All of these places on this list and all of these items I personally use. I am endorsed by nobody, but these are things that I like that are tried and true. I will share my PowerPoint or at least this sheet with everybody so that if you want to go in and check them out, you can see each one of these is hyperlinked. So if you're, all you got to do is click on it and it'll bring you straight to their website. But, you know, I mentioned before, Hudson Valley Seed Co. and Baker Creek and the MI Gardener, which is another seed company that I love, everybody is behind. Uh, either seed companies are shut down right now or, uh, you know, they're, they're projecting that they're shipping like 10 to 14 days later. So let's share our seeds definitely on that one. Um, just a little note, I found out this year that the MI Gardener, the majority of their seeds are 99 cents a pack. Like even the beautiful heirloom varieties that you hardly ever find. The reason that they can keep their costs so far down is they do no catalog. And FYI, they're one of my favorite YouTube channels. We'll see that in a minute. Wild Boar Farms does exotic tomatoes that are unbelievable and super tasty. Brad Yates is a guy that just comes together and does this. Um, Vivo Sun is the heat mat. The Inkbird Controller is for the heat mat controller. Again, the Bootstrap Farmer for the trays and all of my cups. The grower solution is another one that I got the larger containers when I transplanted out. Clyde's garden planner. I don't know if anybody has that, but it's always in the back of my garden journal and it's a super nifty, uh, you'll see it in one of the pictures coming up about when to start, when uh, for spring, for fall, what to direct sow, what the harvest looks like for an, an estimate. Orange Pippin Trees is where we got our trees last year. They're out of uh, Orange County. They're actually in Ithaca, New York. I ordered apple trees from them. Chicken Soup for the Soil with Neptune's Fish Seed Weed as well. And then, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, the Super Duper Seed Swap. So I learned the majority of what I know <laughs> from YouTube. True story. Okay, you can learn a lot online. And these are four of my favorite channels where I'll tune in every day and I'm excited to see what they've put on and what's going on because they've taught me so much. Roots and Refuge, it's a husband and wife, um, a homesteading family out in Arkansas. And my gardener is the gentleman I told you about who also sells seeds now and has a massive catalog. The Rusted Gardener, he is in the Northeast as well, but I'm not sure what state he's in. And the tips and tricks for him is incredible. Um, 
which is making me think that I passed a slide that I wanted to talk about, which was for thinning out seeds. He brought up something really important because anybody that's had to thin out seeds has that same kind of, ugh, that gut wrenching, like I have to kill this seed right now, like this little plant, I have to do this, I have to play God and take this plant out. Um, <laughs> and the way that he says to do it, so again, I just use eights because I start in trays of 32s, right? So if you're planting eight in a row of something, you plant once, especially if the germination rate is good and written on the packet, right? Plant one in each cup, and in the last cup, maybe plant four in the quadrants, or three, or two. So that if you do have one that doesn't come up, that last cup is going to give you several, hopefully, right? And you can always transplant and move it in so that you're not spending so much time thinning. That's in a forward slide. That's why we didn't come to it yet. I remember now and then back to reality is another couple that's homesteading and going back that I loved so again this is also linked if I send it forward everybody can check them out so we were talking earlier about being organized right this is just a bit of my organization Chad has seen my craziness in person um, that's my gardening journal it goes everywhere with me my seeds are in the center I keep them in a plastic container and then each you could see they're, they're done by melon, squash, green veg, beans, peppers, tomatoes, root veg, lettuce, herbs, pumpkins, flowers, and I have an old garden coming, if anybody knows what that is, I'm excited about. Guides, uh, Clyde's garden planner is on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, and it has fall on one side and spring on the other, and it slides out, and you put your frost dates in. Like you slide that ride line over and then it tells you all the dates that you can direct so that you can start from seed and how to move forward. And again, we were talking like those garden markers in there, put your garden markers in. I can't tell you how many times I was like, oh, I'm going to remember what that is. You don't remember what it is. You're, it's not going to happen. You're not going to remember it. Trust me. Take my word for it. Put a garden marker in. So, and the, another thing that's really important, you know, consider a fall crop. Everybody gets so excited about the spring. A lot of people don't think about planting a fall crop. And I think that's partially due to uh, the consumerist nation like that we, that we live in, you know? Come April, May, everything is geared towards growing, right? And then come towards the end of the summer, and now it's back to school. And there's no stuff out that has to do with gardening anymore. Meanwhile, there's a whole season in front of you still to be able to grow. So consider succession planting and consider a fall crop. And again, this all goes into kind of good planning. So, and if anybody's interested, I was just gonna kind of go through my setup and what we have going on right now. So we started, and I know we started super duper early, um, and it was for a specific reason, but we did. We started on February 27th, and then here we go. There's March 3rd, a couple of days later, we had some pretty good germination. And here are a bunch of my seedlings starting to be thinned. And ugh, that gut punch, like, yeah, I had to thin them all. And just two days later, you can see how much healthier each one looks compared to what they were before. So that's another thing. Like, my aunt, she's starting from seed as well this year. And she's like, I can't do it. I can't cut them. I won't thin them. And I'm like, you have to thin them. And she's like, I won't thin them. And I'm like, well... You're going to have a plant that's going to compete for light and nutrients in this cup. You're not going to have a strong, you're not going to have one strong plant. You're going to have two weak plants because you're not going to do it. So I know it hurts. Believe me, it's my least favorite part of this whole process besides smelling the fish guts. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you've listened to the rusted gardener guy, you can do that suggestion and plant the extras in the back and then transplant. But like a week later, I have first true leaves out and out pretty hard. And then a week after that, I've had to transplant cups because they're getting bigger. There's some peppers thrown into the mix. Some more stuff growing. Now on the left-hand slide on the bottom, you could see I started a new batch. So it all the way in the left on the bottom shelf, you could see the cover on. So in order to make sure that those seedlings next to it are high enough, I've just flipped trays over to, have, to you know, elevate them. And then I took a little bit of a break for a while, but that, that's a tomato plant currently in my house. Mm -hmm. And that is my forest of giants right now, which I'm, uh, yeah, giants. And I think 
that's it. So that's my garden. We prepped this weekend. My husband helped build me uh, that tomato trellis there, the wood. That's about 56 square, it's 56 feet of tomato trellis. So we're gonna do a lot of jarring, canning, and preserving for the year. I was mentioning before, if you see in the center, it's hard to see, but those are cow panels that are just flexed over. Um, I'm gonna go pick up another one tomorrow because I have a little bit more room. We're gonna be doing a lot of vertical growing this year in our space just because um, we wanna grow more, more of our own food, which was our plan pre-COVID. So we're lucky that we've been planting and I had our seeds and a lot of the stuff has turned out the way it is. So I believe that is the end of my slideshow. It is. We'll stop sharing. Oh, I thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yes. Yeah, all right. So Nicole, first of all, awesome. Love the presentation. Really, really great. Really thank you. Good. It's, it's beyond all my thoughts. So, but let me go back to my really basic issue. When I've planted things inside before, I um, use, uh, I guess seedling soil or something, and all these little gnats um, show up and they eat all my plants. Like, you know what I'm talking about? No, I have not had that. So, is it a potting soil that you're using? Yes. It, well, it, yeah, it's specifically for like seedlings or something. And I, and I think I read, I, I mean, I've researched it quite a bit, and they say that uh, sometimes, you know, that type of soil attracts. I, I don't fully understand, but maybe little gnats that actually suck into the um, stems and they suck the life out of them and then they end up dying. That's terrible. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. All right. So you haven't heard of that. I have. Has anybody else? Somebody else jump in. I haven't heard of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, are, we've seen them. Those um, are fungus gnats. They're called fungus gnats. And they also they, they lay eggs and I think the lava eat the roots as well. So it's not just the gnats that are bad, but the lava in the soil. And uh, they can be a real problem once they take hold. Uh, there is a, a, a- It's a fungus drench that you put in the soil um, and it does take care of them. We've actually had them in house plants. Yeah, I actually have them recently in house plants. <laughs> That's probably, probably where they came from. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they're, they're existing yeah. in the house plants and when you have the new the new uh, plants, they love it, and so mm -hmm. they, they just move from one to the other. That would make sense. So it's like a fungus thing. Sarah, were you uh, sharing something on that or no? no I was going to tell you, I I start my seedlings with a the sterile starting mix like you are. So I agree with uh, Bill. Those have to be coming from your house plants. You should not be getting those those gnats. I've never had them, quite honestly. I've heard of other people having them, but you should not be getting them from a, you know, commercial uh, potting soil. Okay. I mix potting soil with compost for tomatoes and peppers to make a seed block. But what I do is I actually microwave the composted manure for maybe. I don't know, 30 seconds or a minute to kind of sterilize it, but it still gives you added nutrients for the soil block. So you don't have to transplant them as soon. Another tip. Okay, great. Thank you both. I, I think it actually did come from my house plants because I had a problem. I think so. Well, yeah, great idea. Thank you. They I love house the idea about microwaving the compost because I'm like, how are you bringing that compost in the house safely? But that makes sense. I know people are freaked out by it, but I put it in, I do small batches. So I put it in a, like a big plastic Ziploc bag and you leave it open on the end and you put it in your microwave um, for a short amount of time. And then that way, you know, it kills off some of the bad fungus diseases, whatever might be in there. Cause you have you ever made soil blocks? It's pretty interesting. It's another whole topic, soil blocks. <laughs> I would love to know more about making them. Maybe you can give us a presentation or some information about that. Yeah. Elliot Coleman, he's, a, he's the big uh, godfather of soil blocks. I bought the equipment and I think they're really good for the large plants. I start my smaller plants in, um, Trays. I took a class with Barbara over at Midsummer, 
And she gave me some good tips. I bought a bunch of the 70, I think there's 72 in a tray. I use the, the uh, mix, but then what she does is she puts saran wrap over the top flat. And I use a heat mat. And the saran wrap keeps them warm and she feels that they, the pressure of them having to pop up helps. And then when they're up, you take the saran wrap up. There's a million techniques, but. I've heard of something similar like that. I don't know if anybody's done it with carrots, where you direct sow the carrots and you put a board on top, like a two by four, and you wait two, like two weeks and you just kind of keep checking underneath it. It's to make sure that they don't get dislodged from the rain and, and you know, like kind of just wash away. Has anybody tried that? No. What I do in the, the small seeds in the community garden if I hear a big heavy rainstorms coming, I go out and I just lay some egg cloth over the whole thing. Have had, you know, whole beds wash out. Yeah, I usually use garden fabric uh, when I plant out. Um, it sort of breaks the, the rain if it's really heavy. Yeah, but it also exactly. Keeps it warmer. Uh, and uh, if it's just lying there, you have to check it regularly, but it, it seems to enhance germination. I agree. My issue is the community gardens like close to my house, but not in my backyard. So, you know, it's not convenient that there's a thunderstorm. If there's a big thunderstorm rolling in, I will go over there and take care of it. But I don't want to have to like, you know, every day go move the cloth around. Uh, th thank you for the presentation, Nicole. I'm wondering if we're going to get a copy of that somehow. Sure, I'd love to share it. I have no problem. Should I send it to Michael and Chad and you guys can share it out or? Michael, yeah, I'm not too uh, savvy. So maybe maybe send it to Michael. And I think I think we're going to post the whole meetings on a, I, right, I Michael, got, Peter? Oh, right, we'll... oh, let's see. Um, I started the recording late this time. Sorry about that, folks. Oh, but um, let's see. Um, in just a second, our, our our last show was recorded and it's posted on YouTube. But um, you can find it on this web page. Is there a web page that has all of our info, like all together? We have all of our info all together. Well, I mean, we have everybody's email address on a web page. We don't want to publish that web page, but yeah, but we do have a, like a directory of like 55 email addresses now. People one time or another said they're, of course, we have yours twice, Nicole, at least. My email twice? Yeah. Oh, well, I guess I was very excited. I don't know how that happened. Um, but no, I, I'm just thinking like a place, you know, where Chris's presentation was, my presentation will be like, is there, a destination that everybody can go to resource it that way. Oh, that's a good point. Um, we can we can look into that. Yeah, I, I was going to print up Chris's, and also I would print up yours, and then I could put that in my in my journal. You know what I mean? And then it's just more information. Right, I would be right. honored to be in your journal, Garrett. Honored. <laughs> Uh, we're getting close to the uh, nine o'clock now. Again, people could stay, which letting you know. Uh, I, I just actually had a quick question. Uh, once uh, if something's leggy, could you save it? Absolutely. It really depends on what it is. But I have certainly, like, if I last year in particular, and I apologize for my son in the background, he took a long nap today. <laughs> so that's what that sound is. Um, if something is leggy, especially like a tomato, you can most certainly very carefully just kind of, I use two fingers to just kind of like scoop it out from its cup and put into something deeper to where you think it should start from. Um, I've had some success with doing it with peppers as well, to be fairly honest, and some herbs, but you know, certain things don't like to be transplanted in general. So you can, I always think it doesn't hurt to try, right? If you already got to that point and it used all of its love and hope inside of that, with the seed, you know, inside the seed, give it, give it, give it a chance. Why not, you know? So again, I just want to say quick, uh, and people could ask some more questions um, that, you know, just for next week, 
uh, you know, again, try to send questions in early to Michael or me so we could post them. And uh, also, you know, we're also th also thinking about creating different groups out of this. Uh, you can contact me at growlocalgwl at gmail.com if you have any kind of interest in Victory Garden type, in, type stuff. And uh, hopefully as this group goes on, we'll think of other groups. See, like we're saying, maybe we'll form a seed. You could send seed stuff to me as well. And, you know, maybe I'll talk to Nicole about that. But just letting you guys know if anyone has to leave at 9. Um, uh, do, do we know what next week's topic is going to be, uh, Michael? I, I think we did mention it, and Sarah, I can't remember what we said, though. We had talked about, oh, one was planning a gardening, like, you know, where you're going to put your fence up and talk about fence like that. One was specializing that. Another is composting, and then there's a lot of interest in uh, companion planting. What do people think? What do you, of those three, which would people like to hear for next week? Companion for me. Well... So if you're there in your vote, you get it. And and also not every week we don't always have a presentation. Sometimes we'll just discuss a topic. So, you know, but if people want to, you know, that's a lot of pressure. We don't want to put pressure on everyone to do beautiful presentations every week, even though hopefully we'll have some. But you know, next week next week might just be a topic. So possibly companion planting, but but we'll let you know in the email we send you. But again, anyone uh you know, if anyone has to leave now, thank you so much for joining us. But otherwise if uh, Nicole can hang out, if anyone has any more questions or just wants to talk a little bit, we could go a little bit longer. Well, thank okay. you, everyone. We're going to go thank off you. now. Take care. Thank, thank you. Guys. Thanks, Bill. I'm going to head you. out, too. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. I was going to say, I can definitely, in the PowerPoint, I'll add another section that has a bunch of um, the vertical trellises and different ways that I'm going to help explain, expand some of my space. So just throwing that out there. Has anybody seen the method of hardening the plant where you just rub your hand across the top of the plants and kind of uh, upset them a little bit? And uh, then they, um, it supposedly hardens the stalk. I don't, I don't know what that's called or anything. I do that throughout while I'm growing. Like even with the fan going, I'll go in the room and just like, like how you'd like tussle a little kid's head, I yeah. tussle my plants. Yeah. I mean, you have the fan also. The fan actually does that as well, and right? I have the fan doing it, and I go in there. I mean, some honestly, some of the stalks for my tomatoes, it's incredible, the thickness of them. Like, they're, they're like the size of the pen, and they're small. So I think it has to do with a lot of the agitation of either the fan or having, you know, their little tops kind of tussled left and right. But I would still harden them off after that regardless because they've never seen the sun, you know, like the real sun. They don't know what that right. is really yet and and the wind i mean like the wind is one thing like you're giving it something but think about you know some nights you hit that 60 degree mark i know we like mile an hour we hear that wind going like crazy over here right now does that does that is that a way to fix leggy plants by tussling them a little bit or do you still need to transplant them i would definitely still transplant them um especially like tomatoes because i mean so when a tomato grows, no matter how deep you plant it, it'll start brewing roots from that point. As long as it touches soil, they'll continue to go out. All right. So, um, yeah, I would definitely plant it deeper and still jostle them up as much as you can. Right. Now, the other thing that I was, that I was interested in is my, I'm, I'm very much into, you know, my mom has some stuff and I have some stuff and I, I, I definitely want to do the hot peppers this year. And I was thinking about doing all my hot peppers in, in, in big giant planters because I want to get them into the sun and kind of get, and, and, and that way where the garden is gets medium to heavy sun, but I wanted to put them in direct sun because I know they like heat so much. So the peppers do like heat, but I, in, in my readings and like, you know, my YouTube people that I follow, a hot pepper especially enjoys a little bit of afternoon shade, believe it or not. Okay. If you give them a little bit of afternoon shade, they actually really appreciate that. So where I'm putting my peppers this year, they will get that shade from either the placement of the sun or like where the trellises are going to be. So they'll have right, that right. sun and then get a little bit of a break. The other thing too with peppers is last year, I should just take you in here quick. Last year I had read somebody had showed me that if you, let me grab one that is and grab one that isn't. Ah, do I have any that is? Okay, here we go. 
So if, and if this happened to me for certain peppers this year, if you take your pepper plant, so this pepper plant looks big, right? Beautiful. Right. Leaves. But if you count three sets of first true leaves up, so one, two, three, and then lop that portion off there, you'll, the pepper, you see this one? Yeah. Well, go on. Get out all this other little growth along the stalk. Wow. And instead of shooting up, it's going to start shooting out, which then will give you more fruit later on. It'll give you less stalk and more fruit. It's kind of like topping it. It's like, yeah, exactly. It's, it's yeah. the opposite of tomato pruning. Like when I prune my tomatoes, I prune yeah, my tomatoes to grow up one stalk and take everything right. off the bottom. My peppers, I'm going the other way and lopping the tops off. Okay, thank you. All for the heads. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to leave now. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate it. But you could hang out, and this is great. And uh, see you next week. Good night, Chad. Good night. I have a question um, for anybody that is growing brassicas. Because mine are still dying, mine are still having problems, and I'm starting to wonder if maybe it's a light issue because you brought up the light, and I have them in the window, but they just all look kind of sad. Are they? You what? Are they kind of yellow? Yeah, a little bit. Like this little guy is, he's got like part of his leaves are a little curled up. Looks like it needs fertilizer. Fertilizer? Okay. And more light. More light? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's all, it's like all of the brassicas have the same problem. You could actually start putting those out. I mean, we've had weird weather, but I would start putting them outside on decent days. Okay. And put them in a big tray that you can take out and put them on your deck. But like Nicole was saying, you have to be really careful about too much sun right off. Like I put them on the deck where it's a little bit um, protected. Yeah. And I bring them in at night and I do that for, I don't know, maybe a week, like depending on the weather, a week or two. I have a few, a few things I bought over at Sherman's that I planted out in a flower pot on the deck and they've been out for about three weeks now. They're, okay. they're very hardy, brassicas. Very sturdy. <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. I'll try that. Send them kisses. <laughs> I know. I'm like. I, I totally agree with Sarah Farley. Um, if they're all showing the same symptoms, it mm -hmm. sounds like a nutrition deficiency in yeah. the store. Hit them up with some fish oil. Mm -hmm. And hold your nose. Yeah, fish oil. Fish fertilizer. I call it fish okay. Even though it's all fresh potting soil, even though it's like fresh, never been used it on it. It, they they need a lot of food when they're growing. They're teenagers. Okay. Where yeah, do I get where do I get that chicken soup for the soil? I'll, Garrett, I'll definitely send you if if and if you want it right now. Just send me your email privately or if in the group, whatever. I'll shoot you over my presentation. And like I said, they're all linked in there. Okay. But can I buy that locally or do I have to order that? I ordered it online. It's from um, Dr. Is, Andrew, is it Dr. J? Dr. Jim's with a Z. Dr. Jim's with a Z is the producer of it. Um, and they have all different kinds of chicken soups for the soil, for the pot plants, for the all kinds of plants. Um, but they have one specifically for tomatoes that I use. All right, I'm gonna send you over my email. Sure. I'll you definitely can always go over to Waitsons and look, they have quite a supply over there. They may have, they sell the organic uh, fish fertilizer and they may have something similar if you, you know, don't want to have it shipped. Right. Maybe I'm just impatient. We all are. I actually, I don't know how much, I think I have a bunch left, Garrett, but if I come pick up bamboo, I can bring you a little bit tomorrow. Because you, you, you have go. to lower it. You have to um, uh, dilute it. That was the word. Okay. 
Yeah, just bring me a little bit, and I'll 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 I'll, I'll rock it on my plants, and I'll I'll trade you for something. And uh, yeah, you can see uh, I I haven't even to be honest with you, I've been so busy with the chickens right now and getting their whole setup set up that the garden is falling by the wayside a little bit, and I need to finish that tomorrow with the good weather, and then get back to the garden um, and seeing where that goes. It sounds like we're a bit parallel, actually. Our chickens are coming probably sometime next week. Um, so we're in the process of building coop and getting run ready. But like I, I, with my husband, we sat down and we said, we're going to focus garden first. The chickens are going to be inside for a while. But um, Here, I'll, I'll show you here if you can see that. Oh, nice. Our coop is going to look very similar. Beautiful. Yeah, we did a lot of, we did a lot of work. Um, the, uh, the, the, the trick of it, I think, is to have a double door opener um, for the amount of chickens that we have that we can clean out the hole inside. And I finally moved them in yesterday. I moved them in, and now I just have to complete the run. So, and all of our feeding, all of our feeding and watering is going to be accessed from outside the run, so you don't have to keep ducking in and swapping yep. out food all the time. So I watched a lot of videos to find it and. We kind of just hobbled it together, but at least I haven't bought anything for it, really. So that's look that you were ahead of the game by miles on that point. Yeah, um, I got to go. It's been great. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. everybody. Have a nice night. Okay. Take care. Okay, I, and you call happy. me. We'll talk tomorrow. All right. You got it, Garrett. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. -bye. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. I'm gonna take off. Also, have a good Bye. week, everybody. Good night. Thank good you, everybody. Night. Gillian, you didn't ask any questions tonight. No, I know. I'm just listening and auditing. Okay. Gillian, you look like you're on you're on a flower petal or something over there. I know. Zoom lets you pick backgrounds. You're so fancy. <laughs> I need to um, take off as well, but I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Take care, everyone. You too. Oh, I have to stop recording. <laughs>